Okay, so this is the uh, three pillars, class number four, the fourth promise of the covenant of love, I will educate them. And we're gonna start out this time with the morning offering prayer. So I've got it on the slide. It's also in your trifold if you wanna uh, look on that one. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. What I bear and endure, what I say and what I dare, what I think and what I cherish, all the merits that I gain, what I direct and what I conquer, all my joys and all my sorrows, what I am and what I have, I give to you as a gift of love. Use it so that the holy stream of graces flowing richly from the shrine may fill the souls of those who have given their hearts to Shinstat and gently lead there all those whom you wish to choose in kindness. Accept everything that our efforts may be fruitful, which we dedicate to the Trinity. Okay, so for the scripture that we're going to start with this time, it's Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to give you hope and a future. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. So when you hear this scripture passage, what thoughts come to your mind? Mm-hmm. Yep. He already has it laid out for us. We shouldn't worry. Anything else? Yeah. I, I always find it comforting to know, too, that if we seek him, we will find him. Sometimes we feel like we're kind of messing this whole spiritual journey thing up, you know. And he's got us on this path, and he's going to continue to direct us. So I find that very comforting. <coughs> Okay, the next thing that we wanted to look at is um, we're talking about having a work list for the Blessed Mother, and we're asking her to do things. We're putting it in our home shrine. If you already have your home shrine, what answers have you seen to the prayer request that you put in your home shrine? Anybody want to share one? Mm hmm Okay, so her son had an injury and they put the request in the home shrine and it healed really quickly, all right? Another person I know told me that with this bad December recently that uh, she put it in her home shrine because her husband was going to the airport to pick up their daughter and uh, about 20 minutes after he left, he called and told her that he was on his way back because the roads were way too bad for him to, to make it all the way to the airport. And it all worked out fine because her daughter was not able to come home anyway and everybody was safe. That was her main prayer request was that her whole family would be safe. And so they were amazed at how God worked it out because her daughter was able to travel home um, with other relatives who had just lost um, a sibling. And so what they you know, had no idea what's happening. God knew and took care of it. All right. What about unanswered prayers? Sometimes we don't get the answer that we expect. Does that mean that we're not loved by God or the Blessed Mother? Does it mean that we don't have enough faith? What are your thoughts about that when the prayer request doesn't get answered the way we expect? It's Okay, that's good. It's in God's time and not ours. Sometimes things have not fallen into place yet for that particular prayer request to be answered. All right? Yes, sometimes God answers it in a different way because he knows that way is best. Um, we have to trust that he knows best rather than us. Sometimes we think we, we know how it should be, right? All right, and it doesn't mean that we're not loved. God loves all of us equally. I remember when um, one of the saints said this, that God loves each of us the same as he loves a saint. So when I think about how much he loved Mother Teresa and how good she was and everything, and to know that he loves me just as much as her, it's like, wow, that's amazing. All right, so tonight we're going to learn about um, how um, the Blessed Mother plans to educate us. So after you graduated from high school and CCD classes or Catholic school,
how have you continued to learn in any way about your faith? Like, what are the normal ways that you feel like you've learned more um, about your faith? Going on retreats. Going on retreats, okay. Homilies at church, yep. Some people do like the spiritual reading, like the booklet, The Word Among Us. They'll read the mass readings and that type of thing. And um, it's amazing how much you learn little by little in, in doing the reflections, right? So there's lots and lots of opportunities for us to learn about our faith. I am personally amazed at how many people are now interested in learning more about their faith, and I think it's as a result of Shinstat. I was so touched when Shinstat started in our parish, and I went to Father Mondike one time, and I said, I don't know what's happening in our parish, but something is happening. And he said, what do you mean? And I said, I used to offer things, and nobody would come, and I would have to cancel thing after thing after thing. And um, he said, it's the Blessed Mother. Of course they're coming. She's bringing them. I'm like, if only I'd have known a long time ago that it was, you know, it could have been a lot easier. <laughs> Prove to me that you love me. Diligently bring me contributions to the capital of grace. So what kinds of contributions is the mother thrice admirable speaking about when she's asking us to bring contributions to the capital of grace? Yes, yes. Sometimes we think it has to be just all of these great things or whatever, but just the ordinary things. She wants our, our pains, our sufferings, our joys, you know, everything, our challenges, we bring them all to her. And how we do that is by saying that consecration prayer at the beginning of every day. I consecrate to you my eyes, my ears, my mouth, my heart, my entire self. And um, some of the other Shinstop prayers also uh, specifically talk about that. Mary wants to form us into the perfect image of Christ so that when people see us, they begin to see more and more like, oh, that's how Jesus would act. She wants us to know our purpose in life. How would it be helpful to us if we knew what our purpose was? This is a challenge, right? Because sometimes we're like, I don't know what my purpose is. What am I supposed to be doing? And we kind of like try to do the best we can with that. but. Um, I, I have found that as I've delved deeper into Shinstat, the Blessed Mother reveals to us what our purpose is. And that is very helpful. So I'm going to give you some information about that in just a little bit. Mary promises to educate our youth. I don't want you to put your hand up or anything, but sometimes we have children who have left the church or they don't believe in God anymore. And I have heard so many stories about uh, families who have made a covenant of love, and their children have come back to the faith. Sometimes mothers have shared stories with me, and they never, ever in their lifetime thought it would ever happen because their child was so adamant that, you know, they didn't believe in God anymore, and they had strayed, you know, a long way, you might say, from God. So it's amazing what the Blessed Mother does. So Shinstadt's method of self-education um, contains the personal ideal, which I'm going to give you the booklet about, a special resolution, which basically means that each month you're going to try to work on a virtue. And um, when we work on one virtue, we grow in all of the virtues. So each of us individually will choose what is it that we feel like God is calling us to work on this next month. And then we do something called a spiritual daily order, and that helps us to be accountable to ourselves only, or you can also use it in confession if you choose to do that. But we go through and we um, like look at it each day, like how am I doing in that? We write specific things that we want to do to help us to grow in a virtue. So we'll, we'll do that in just a minute. By doing this, it helps us to develop the good in us and helps us to overcome our weaknesses it provides stability and discipline, that word that we hate, right, in striving for holiness, okay? So the discipline is very important for us. Our personal ideal and mission is a clearly formulated goal and mission to fulfill so that we can accomplish great things. 
God has given each of us a very personal mission in life. So he's created you to do something that nobody else has ever been created for. He has something in particular for you. St. Therese of Lisieux taught that the most important thing in the lives of the saints was their very personal mission. It consumed them and it enabled them to become saints. So a little bit more about the personal ideal. It's the purpose of our existence here on earth, earth for which God created us. It's determined by our personality traits, which of course God gave us, our basic disposition, and by the inner power that motivates us to action. It gives meaning to our thoughts and actions as we see our clearly unique contribution to the renewal of the world. So how do we discover what it is? We first have to know our basic disposition, our temperament, our main tendencies, and personal qualities. We look at what motivates us, our likes and dislikes. Here's some examples. Everything with love. A living tabernacle, bearer of Christ. Leading through serving. And now I've got some that I want to see if you can tell me who this person is, whose personal ideal this is. My food is to do the will of my Father. Who is that? Jesus. Mm -hmm. Behold the handmaid of the Lord. Yep. Mary. Mm -hmm. All things to all people. This was one of the writers, one of the main writers of the New Testament of the Bible. Anybody know who that was? Who was the main one? Who wrote most of the letters? Paul. Yep, St. Paul. This is one of our most recent popes. Totally yours. Anybody know who that was? That's what totus tuus means, that program that they have in the summer for our youth. And this is St. Uh, John Paul II's um, personal ideal. So it takes time and thought and prayer to discover what it is. So if you have your books with you, I want you to like put a dog ear or a bookmark on pages 65 to 66. Because if, if you look at that and take it to prayer, it has questions that you can look through and um, think about, and it will help you to reveal things about yourself. Once we know our personal ideal, we try to reflect on its meaning and its message, and it helps us to strive for our goal. A lot of people, once they know it, it helps them to discern whether they should say yes or no to certain things that people ask them to do. Because it's a lot easier when you know, okay, this is the way God created me. This is my main focus in life, is to do this. Then it's easy to say no to some of these other things that may be good things, but it's not what you are supposed to be doing. Okay, so I'm going to hand out a stapled um, pamphlet to everybody, and that also, when you read it, will help you to figure out your um, personal ideal. So I just ask you to take it to prayer and little by little read it and uh, try to figure out what you think it might be. <clears throat> For me, this took months and months to pray about it, try to discern. Um, I brought it to a spiritual director and said, you know, what do you think? I think it might be this. I think it might be that. What do you think? And one of the things when I said it, they were like, yep, that's it. And I'm like, okay, I wish I knew that, you know. But just from, from meeting with them regularly, they were able to discern it a lot easier than, than I was. Okay, and then the next thing that I'm going to hand out, I want you to take two of these. One you're going to write on, and the other one you're going to use to copy. All right, some people may remember booklets like these, and um, these are all spiritual daily orders. So, this is what this next sheet is, is it's a spiritual daily order. <clears throat> As soon as everybody's got that, I'll kind of explain um, what it is. 
So at the top of it, you're going to write what month it is. So you can start with January. I would encourage you to start doing it right away. All right. Particular examination is also called special resolution. So that would be like, what virtue do I want to work on this month? Okay. So I'm going to ask you to actually, you know, write something down there or, you know, jot something that you feel like, God would want you to work on. All right, so we're just choosing one thing so that we can be intentional. If we try to do too many things, it's overwhelming to us. So we, we try to you know, concentrate on one thing. So an example would be like, let's say I feel like I'm selfish, okay? So the virtue that I would wanna work on is the opposite of that, and that would be generosity. So I would have to decide, okay, do I want to be more generous in my time? Do I want to be more generous in my talents, like helping people to, you know, to do what I feel like I know how to do? Do I want to be more generous with my money? All right, toward a particular person or toward a particular group. Okay, so I would write that down um, on the line where it's, or in the box actually, where it says particular examine, okay? And then in the boxes underneath it, I would write different things that I want to do to try to help me. So let's say I feel like I'm stingy with my money, okay? What are some things that a person could do to try to grow in the virtue of generosity if they felt they were stingy? I'll just leave that up to you. What, what, what can you think of? What could a person write in those boxes? Okay, I want to find a charity that I could donate to. Okay, what else? Okay, yes, volunteering. Like if I feel like um, I'm stingy with my time, volunteering would be a good one. Anything else you can think of? And so each day what I'm going to do then is before I go to bed at night, I'm going to look at my daily uh, spiritual order and I'm going to, going to put like a check mark, like, yes, I did that well, or maybe a minus, like, uh, I failed miserably today. Some of the things that are on mine, I don't do every single day. Like I've got monthly confession on there to remind myself all the time I want to go to confession once a month. So a lot of days I'll have a minus, like, nope, didn't do it. But it's always that reminder every day, like, oh, this weekend fathers are going to hear, you know, confessions before, for masses or whatever. So one of these weeks I'm going to go, okay, that kind of thing. So you can put as many items on there as you want. Sometimes there's only a couple of items that I have on the list. And other times it's more. It could be things related to prayer. You know, like, let's say I decide I want to read, um, read part of a gospel each day this month, or I want to spend 10 minutes in prayer. Let's say I'm only doing five now, and so I want to like up it to 10, you know, whatever it is. And when you take it to prayer and ask God, like, what is it that you want me to work on? A lot of times it's amazing how fast it's like, oh, <laughs> there's a whole bunch of things I could be doing, right? Okay. All right, so the spiritual daily order helps us to be more disciplined, have more self-control, and to keep our priorities straight. We check it once a day to see how we're making progress, okay? And we can do that in a lot of different ways. It's important to write it down. We list what we want to improve, and we check ourselves daily. Now, there's an app. If you don't like using the paper copy and you have your cell phone with you almost all the time, there's an app called Agenvita. I have a picture of it on my cell phone. It's the AV, and I've got it spelled out there for you. It's a free app, so you can go in and install that app, and then you can check it on your phone all the time. That way you've got it with you, and it's easy to um, be accountable that way. Every month it deletes the things that you've got on there as far as like what you're working on and everything, so you start fresh every month. You may want to repeat some of the things more than one month, or you may want to do something totally different. So you have that option. This is what it looks like once you have it installed. 
on each of these, you click on it and then like it, it'll say, you know, what do you want to do like to improve your relationship with God? What do you want to do to improve yourself? What about, is there something with others? They list with nature and I usually skip that one, but you know, whichever ones apply to you, you can just click on it. And then when you click on it, it allows you to add something and you can add multiple ones. Let's say you wanted to, um, work on your relationship with God and you wanted to add like four things, well then it allows you to do that if you want to do that. Okay. So this is the sheet that I just gave you. And now I want to go more into Father Kentonick's life um, so that you have a feeling uh, for what he was like. So last uh, time that we met, I talked about how Father Kentonick was conceived out of wedlock, and that was in the late 1800s, and it was very, very unacceptable at the time. <clears throat> Father Kentonick's father never, ever acknowledged that Joseph Kentonick was his son, and that hurt Father Kentonick greatly. It also um, was a detriment to him in some other ways, so I'm going to uh, share a little bit about that one, about that in this uh, particular presentation. So Father Kentonick's grandfather died when he was two and a half years old. At the time, they were living with um, that family, like his mother's family. <clears throat> his mother and grandmother were very, very poor. As a young boy, when he was six, he prayed with enthusiasm, and he would frequently pray this prayer, Help, Mary, it's time. So you can only imagine this poor little boy, right, that their needs were so great. He knew his grandmother well, and she would frequently tell the story about how there were uh, demons that were always in search of souls, hunting souls, all night long hunting souls. And in the story that his grandmother told, um, everything ended when it was 6 a.m. when Mary was um, prayed to um, at the time that the Angelus bells rang at church. Now, did you guys know that we have these bells on our church? Like, not only do our bells chime every hour and half hour, but at 6 a.m., noon, and 6 p.m., the bells are different. Because when the church was built, and there were a lot of people that were in the farm community, they would listen for these bells, and when they heard these bells, they would pray that Angelus prayer, which is like, the angel of the Lord declared unto Mary, and she conceived of the Holy Spirit, Hail Mary. And it, yeah, there's three, like, separate like intercessions with that. After many part-time jobs in domestic work, his mother was offered a full-time position. It was in an upper class home. They expected you to live there where you worked. You had to be unmarried and no children were welcome. So the grandmother was now 75 years old and if this was the hardest decision that Father Kentonick's mother ever had to make because she had to decide whether or not she was going to put him in an orphanage in order to be able to accept this position because they needed the money, okay? And so she took over a year or almost a year to make that decision, and finally she decided that that's what she was going to do. Part of the reason was because Father Kentonick already wanted to be a priest, and she knew that the orphanage had nuns and priests that would give him a really, really good schooling, and so that's what she was interested in. So even though the mother did bring him to the orphanage and he lived there, they stayed in close contact. So it's not like he never saw his mother again. That's not the case at all. She was in regular contact with him. At age 12, he wanted to be a priest. And I already mentioned that he was schooled by the priests and nuns. So this is the statue um, that's in the chapel and in the orphanage that his mother brought him to. And his mother took her only prized possession, which was a gold chain with a crucifix from her first communion, and she hung it around the neck of the statue. She told the Blessed Mother that she was unable to be a mother to her child anymore, and that Mary should educate the child and be the mother and take her place as mother. The consecration took place on April the 12th of 1894, and Joseph participated in it, and he said it had a huge impact on his life. He felt that from that time on, Mary was his mother, that she was shaping him and forming him into the person that he became. 
This is a picture of the dorm in the orphanage that he lived in. It's a little bit, not the best picture, but kind of gives you an idea. Oops, went too far. And then this was the classroom and the outside area. His other prayer to Mary was, Hail Mary, for the sake of your purity, keep me pure in body and soul. Open wide to me your heart and the heart of your son. Give me souls and keep everything else for yourself. When he made his first confession, he was um, his mother shared that she had made her first confession when she was about 12 or 13 years old. And that her experience was that a priest had, had put a um, crucifix in front of her and said, every time you sin, you're driving a nail into Jesus. And that that made such an impact on all of the children who made their first confession. Um, she shared that story with Joseph before he made his first confession and she said that every single time she went to confession, she would always remember that. So the idea that sin is, is really, um, really painful to Jesus. When he was 12, he made his first communion and his confirmation. And when he did, that was when he told his mother that he knew for sure he wanted to be a priest. His mother responded at the time, boy, we have to pray very, very, very much. So the reason for that was because under canon law, if you were an illegitimate child, you could not be ordained as a diocesan priest. So does everybody know what a diocesan priest is? That's what most of, like all of our priests in our cluster are all diocesan priests. That means that the man who... Um, they take a vow of obedience to is the bishop. They know that they're only going to be serving the church within that diocese. Um, and so he was not allowed to be a diocesan priest, which is what his heart you know, told him he wanted to do, right? So the only way that he could become a priest was if he decided to become a religious order priest. When you do that, then you can be sent wherever the religious order is. Like for instance, I have two uncles who are priests that are precious blood priests. They've been to Florida and um, South America, Colorado, California, they, you know, all over, wherever they uh, would be called is where they would have to go. Okay. So Joseph did not feel like he was supposed to be a religious order priest. And his mother was wrestling with what do I do now? So she wondered if she should go back to Joseph's father after all that time and beg him to marry her. Can you imagine how hard that would be as a woman if he decided that he didn't want to acknowledge this was even his child and to have to do that. But she talked to the parish priest about it and he said no, she should not do it. But he was aware that there was a young community that was just in Germany called the Palatines and he suggested that Father Kentenich would join that, or that order and he did. So his illegitimate background was a source of a uh, with the lack of a biological father was a source of great suffering for him until he died. He himself describes that this was a very heavy cross that he had to, to uh, carry. As a 16 year old, he wrote this poem, homeless, abandoned and lonely, I wander the world. My father rejects me, nowhere is home. Plucked by harsh hand from a mother's love, a cold world rejects me, I'm lost in the crowd. I see peace all around me. They speak with great cheer, praising their parents. I weep and walk out. My heart is quite frozen for no one loves me. I wait and keep watch. Will no one love me? So he knew that his mother and grandmother loved him and stuff, but that rejection from his father was so significant um, in his life. We're almost done with this presentation, so just a couple more slides here. Father Ketnick had a great love of the Trinity. He mentioned several times that he was painfully aware that people are unaware of the presence of God in their lives, and they don't realize that God is a strong, loving, and merciful Father. So I just bring that out um, just to help us to get to know him a little bit better. And he also said, in every situation in life, learn to give a joyful yes. 
trusting that, you know, this is what God um, wants to happen. Okay, and we'll close with the consecration prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. My queen, my mother, I give myself entirely to you, and to show my devotion to you, I consecrate to you this day my eyes, my ears, my mouth, my heart, my entire self without reserve. As I am your own, my good mother, guard me and defend me as your property and possession. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.